In June 1940, over a third of a million British and French soldiers were plucked to safety from the beaches of Dunkirk. The miracle of the evacuation has since become a part of our national folklore. But there is another, often overlooked story behind the myth. For the British Expeditionary Force would never have made it back to England without the courage and sacrifice of the young soldiers ordered to delay the German advance at all costs. If necessary, they were to fight to the last man, last round. And I thought to myself, last man, last round. I'd heard that before in my military history. And I thought, my goodness, I didn't think this would happen to me so soon in my career. Lance Corporal Rose was his name. I said, uh, where's, the, where's the officer? He's dead. Where's your sergeant? He's dead. Where's your corporal? He's dead. I said, you're, you're the only one left in charge. And yes, he said. But while the return of the exhausted BEF was celebrated across the country, little thought was given to the 40,000 men captured by the Germans. For them, this was just the beginning of five years of imprisonment, forced labor, and the constant threat of death or punishment. He gave me a postcard, and it was all typed in English. The prisoner of war, Charles Waite, was to be taken to his headquarters on the charge of incitement to mutiny. That scared the life out of me. <laughs> this is the extraordinary story of Dunkirk, the forgotten heroes. This is Charles Waite. Charles was 21 years old when he was captured by the Germans in the spring of 1940. This is me, 1941, and I'd then at that time been a prisoner about a year, roughly a year. Charles spent five years in captivity in Poland. He hasn't left the country since he returned home in 1945 but is now planning a trip back to France to retrace the events that shaped his life 70 years ago. And at 91, he's just received his first passport. At 91 years old, I have not ever had a passport. I can't even believe I've got one now, and I'm very pleased to have it. Charles's journey into captivity began with the outbreak of war in September 1939 when along with hundreds of thousands of others, he was conscripted into the desperately undermanned British Army. In peacetime, Charles worked as a greengrocer in his family's shop and was worried about the harsh realities of war. I was then 20. I didn't mind going, but I really and truly wanted not to go into anything where I was going to have to go out and kill anybody, if you like to put it that way. I didn't think this was right. I said it could be somebody that's got a family of children and it didn't seem right for me to have to go out and kill somebody like that. I would, if I did, I would have been terribly upset about it. Meanwhile, territorial regiments were busy preparing their part-time Saturday night soldiers for action. Joe Trinder from Bybury had joined the territorials of the 5th Battalion, the Gloucestershire Regiment, before the outbreak of war. And then, of course, when war broke out, we were all called on. And we went to, uh, went to Felton, guard duties at Felton Aerodrome. I got married from Felton. They gave me 48 hours to get married. My wife, has, beforehand, she said, well, I don't care if they only give us 12 hours. We're going to get married. Hitler's not going to stop me from getting married. <laughs> Across the country, there were emotional scenes as Britain's soldiers said goodbye to their loved ones. In Scotland, farm labourer and territorial soldier David Mowat 
had joined the 4th Battalion of the Seaforth Highlanders. Today, 70 years after the events of 1939, he is still haunted by the memory of his mother's grief when he told her that he was leaving home to fight. Oh, <laughs> it's like it, uh, it was, well, I, I broke down as well, sort of thing, you know, and she was in a terrible state. I was the youngest of the family. I'm only 19, you know. I said, I was the youngest of seven. And uh, that was, that, that got to me there. But we both broke down, like, you know. The first contingent of the British Army to be sent to France, the British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, began their journey across the Channel on the 4th of September, 1939. By the middle of October, Four divisions, each totaling around 13,000 men, had arrived in France. These were all regular soldiers, the elite of the British Army, and they quickly took up position on the French side of the Franco-Belgian border. For the time being, given Belgium's neutrality, they could advance no further. Along with their French allies, the BEF awaited the expected German attack, but it didn't come and for the first few months during the period known as the Phony War, there was little serious activity. But as they spent their time training and digging trenches in the frozen fields of northern France, many began to realize that the BEF was seriously unprepared for modern warfare. Julian Fain was a 19-year-old second lieutenant in the 2nd Battalion of the Gloucestershire Regiment. They were busy te teaching us to dig trenches and build barbed wire, which I rather s thought was sort of not quite the sort of training I'd expected for a modern war. It sort of seemed to appear to me to be based on the whole 1914-18 war. In the weeks and months that followed, the regular soldiers were joined by thousands of new recruits, conscripts and territorials, hurriedly sent across the channel to bolster army numbers. And by the end of April, there were almost 400,000 British soldiers in France. But men like David Mowat had no idea what fate had in store for them. When we all we gathered together to get on that boat, it was great, but we were going somewhere different. And uh, to us it was very exciting, yes. And we have had no thought at all about going into action or anything like that sort of thing. But all that was to change when on the 10th of May, the Germans launched the Blitzkrieg with a lightning assault on Belgium and Holland. As paratroopers and panzer divisions swept through Western Europe, British and French soldiers moved swiftly into Belgium to halt the German advance. Barriers are rising all along the frontiers of Belgium and France. Day and night, day after day, the Allies are rolling in to repeat the story of 1914 all over again. Within days, the BEF were having their first encounters with the enemy. Bill Lacey of the 2nd Battalion of the Gloucesters was on guard duty when a German soldier stumbled upon his position. Bill automatically raised his bayonet. There was a grunt and that was it. I think it must have gone through his heart, went straight through his chest anyhow. The weight of him on the bayonet, and I'd had the rifle between my legs, brought me right over, nearly on top of him. I never expected to do that kind of thing. It was, this was the first thing that had happened. Ever after, I thought all, all the German army was out for revenge on me. It soon became apparent that the German invasion of Belgium was all part of an elaborate trap. As British and French forces moved north into Belgium, 
A second German attack below them through France quickly divided Allied lines. Just four days after taking up their new positions, the BEF was in danger of being outflanked and the command was given to withdraw. In the initial stages of this fighting withdrawal, there was no talk of evacuation, but that time would soon come. And when it did, some of the BEF would be ordered to form a defensive line to slow the German advance, giving their colleagues time to escape. If that line failed to hold, the British army in France would face annihilation. This is the untold story of what happened to those men ordered to stand and fight to the last man, last round, and of those who didn't make it back. It's now been 70 years since ex-prisoner of war Charles Waite made his fateful journey across the channel in the spring of 1940. Today, Charles is on his way back to France to retrace his footsteps and to remember those of his colleagues who didn't make it home. At 91, this is the first time Charles has been abroad since the war. I feel marvelous to think that I'm able to be standing here on this ferry Looking across the water, it's, it's a marvellous sensation, it really is, I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled. Charles first left home to join the British Expeditionary Force in France in April 1940. Less than a month later, the Germans launched the Blitzkrieg. As French and Belgian lines crumbled around them, the BEF was quickly forced into a fighting withdrawal. This wasn't yet a full-scale retreat to the coast, but rather a way of consolidating defensive positions and strengthening the British line. But as they moved westwards through Belgium, it was a confusing time for those who wanted to stand and fight. It was retreat all the time. It was terrible, really. So many times you got ready and keyed up to have a go, and then you had to retreat, and you hadn't fired a shot. I felt, I mean, you know, very despondent and disappointed that we should be withdrawing. It's not what we joined the army to do. In the days ahead, Julian Fane and the rest of the Gloucesters would have a significant role to play in forming the last line of defence. But for now, they joined the rest of the BEF in the fighting withdrawal westwards through Belgium. By the 20th of May, seven divisions of the BEF had taken up new defensive positions along a 32-mile front west of the River Esco. Gunner Bill Stanton of the 5th Gloucesters and his number two, Dickie Bird, were to prevent the Germans from crossing the river. And Bill had a perfect view of the enemy as they approached and I could see them dragging things down to the river edge and it was rubber boats. And uh, I mean, uh, if, if you fight in the war, you wait for the best chance that you've got, which is what I did. I waited until they were in the center of the river and that was it. I can see them now jumping out the boats and the bullets splashing on the water and uh, you can see the people jumping up in the boats and their arms up in the air and the equipment going off board and men jumping into the water or falling into the water. But at the time, I was really in the glory doing it because that was my job. Dickie Bird was shouting, keep it going. He was, he was busy patting me on the back all the time, you know, and uh, he was really feeling good, I was too. Meanwhile, the German sweep through France had advanced at a rapid pace, and by the 20th of May, they had reached the sea near Abbeville. Their arrival caught many by complete surprise. I looked across to this field, and there must have been, I would say, three to 400 German troops coming in that direction on the road, well, I would say possibly up to a dozen German tanks. 
it was it was terrifying. For ten minutes, quarter of an hour, there was nothing but firing. So I just threw myself down and dropped my rifle and just laid there. There were just 18 of us, and within, I would say within five or 10 minutes, most of them were either dead or dying, and we were in a terrible mess. And I was that scared that I turned round on my stomach to face them, taking my steel helmet off at the same time, because I wanted to get it over quick, because it was, to me, it was obvious this was our day. We weren't gonna see any more. Suddenly, on the road, there was a huge German standing up there. He looked like a giant to us, because he was, he was an officer. He was pointing a rope revolver at us and calling out, up Tommy, up Tommy. Hands on the heads, that's what they kept saying. And a hawk. Know what it is now, but we didn't know then. <laughs> and we then started to walk up the road. With the Germans at the coast below them, and the French and Belgian armies in disarray, the BEF was in danger of being trapped with their backs to the sea. It was now that British commanders decided that the only way to save the army was through a mass evacuation from the beaches of Dunkirk. As the Germans encroached from all sides, all that remained was a narrow corridor some 30 miles wide through which the British army and her allies could escape to the coast. But if they were to succeed, that corridor would have to be rigorously defended. Amongst the regiments ordered to stand and fight were the Gloucesters, and on the 25th of May, their two battalions began to take up position. The second battalion of the Gloucesters was sent here to Cassel, a tiny hilltop town with commanding views of the otherwise flat Flanders countryside. While below them on these plains, the 5th battalion was to make its stand at the villages of Arnique and Ledringham. The positions held by the two battalions of the Gloucesters were just part of a number of defensive strong points on the road to Dunkirk, to be held at all costs, if necessary, to the last man, last round. We actually had the order that we were to remain behind to cover Dunkirk. And I thought to myself, last man, last round. I'd heard that before in my military history. And I thought, my goodness, I didn't think this would happen to me so soon in my career. We were attacked repeatedly by infantry, tanks, artillery and aircraft. So we had a very busy time and suffered quite a few casualties. Of course, the chances of getting killed were quite, uh, quite great. By now, Operation Dynamo, the plan to evacuate the BEF from Dunkirk, was underway. British commanders believed that if the defensive corridor could be held for two days, up to 45,000 men could be saved. In the meantime, an armada of vessels, from destroyers to fishing boats, was already crossing the channel, hoping to rescue as many men as possible before it was too late. Meanwhile, at the village of Arnik, where the 5th Battalion of the Gloucesters were holding the line, gunner Bill Stanton and his number two, Dickie Bird, were in position at a railway embankment. Advancing towards them across open countryside were over a hundred German soldiers from the feared SS Liebstandart Regiment, Hitler's personal bodyguards. So I waited and waited, and when they got into the middle of the field, I started firing. And they were dropping all, the, all along the field. And then they started, the second rank started to, to run, and they were coming to the embankment. I knew we'd had it. With the SS beginning to outflank them, Bill and Dickie took cover behind a house and prepare to fire. And the ones coming round the house I've got, they went down. And uh, I said to Dickie, Dickie, another magazine, and he put another magazine, and I heard 
and he, Dickie, got up. He jumped up and he ran about 10, 15 yards and then dropped. He'd been hit and uh, I don't know what it was. It, uh, something made him get up. I think it was a shock of being hit. He got up and ran and he, he dropped and he, he he, he must have been dead while he was moving because he fell down. He, when I got to him, I looked at him and he was dead. I thought, well, that's me. Seconds later, Bill was shot in the jaw. With blood streaming down his face, he made it back to the road where he was picked up by a truck and driven to safety. He was taken by ambulance to Dunkirk, where he was transferred to a waiting boat. I got on board and the first thing a sailor said to me, do you want a cup of tea? And I nearly took his hand off getting it. But that sticks out, you know, really sticks out. That. Do you want a cup of tea, son? After risking his life to hold his position for as long as he could, Bill had had a narrow escape. But what would happen to the rest of those holding the line and to those who didn't make it to the beaches? Ex-prisoner of war Charles Waite is on his way to Dunkirk to see for the first time the beaches from which so many escaped 70 years ago. By the time the last man had been plucked to safety from Dunkirk in June 1940, Charles was already on his way to captivity in Poland. Today the roads are relatively quiet, but back in 1940 they were clogged with refugees and littered with transport and equipment, abandoned by the men of the British Expeditionary Force as they made their way towards the coast. With the Germans advancing by the hour, the desperate evacuation of the BEF from the beaches of Dunkirk had begun on the 26th of May. Within the first 48 hours, nearly 8,000 men had been rescued, but there were still tens of thousands in danger of being left behind. Meanwhile, in the towns and villages around Dunkirk, defensive strong points had been set up to delay the German advance. These positions were to be held at all costs, and amongst the regiments ordered to hold the line were the Gloucesters. Joe Trinder was a territorial in the 5th Battalion of the Gloucesters, which had been holding the small village of Ledringham since the 26th of May. We got stonked on the terrible. We had mortar bombs, four-inch mortar bombs coming down on us like hail. After a spirited defence, the Gloucesters were ordered to withdraw on the 28th of May. Almost encircled by the Germans, some men mounted a last-ditch bayonet charge to force the enemy out of the village. They just fixed the bayonet and they went down through the, through the village like a load of locusts. The old CO, he led the charge, waving his pistol, you know. Up the Gloucesters, he said, and, and they routed the Jerry out of the village. They did that twice. At Cassell, the second Gloucesters fought valiantly to defend the town, as German troops and panzers began to break into company positions. Then, on the evening of May the 29th, the second Gloucesters were themselves ordered to withdraw to the coast. By the time they left Cassell, their actions had helped close to 100,000 men escape from Dunkirk. But Cassell itself was in flames and surrounded. We realised that our chances were negligible and that um, obviously the Germans had completely outflanked us. But one still had in one's mind that um, not to give in, one had to escape. One, something had to be done to avoid dying. You don't just give in. In the withdrawal from Cassell, 19-year-old officer Julian Fane 
was hit in the arm by shrapnel. But in a remarkable act of courage and leadership, he led a party of a dozen men to Dunkirk. Their epic journey took over four days, across a landscape teeming with Germans. It was a miraculous escape. But not all made it to Dunkirk. A 91-year-old ex-prisoner of war, Charles Waite, was one of them. This is his first visit to see the beaches he never saw 70 years ago. I'm sorry now that I hadn't been before, because I should have done. Should have been here before. By the 4th of June, 1940, Dunkirk had fallen into German hands and Operation Dynamo was over. Along with Charles, more than 30,000 men were taken into captivity and most wouldn't see home again for the next five years. I'm sure I can say this for everybody, for all of us, how badly we missed England and our people at home. There's nothing like England. And it was a terrible time when I was away and dreamed about it, getting back every day, practically. Despite the fact that so many had been captured, the operation was a success, and over 338,000 British and French soldiers were evacuated, far in excess of the 45,000 British commanders had originally hoped for. Over 8,000 British troops had been killed, and twice that number wounded. But if it hadn't been for the courage of those who fought to hold the line, the entire British expeditionary force might have perished on the beaches. They must never be forgotten. They gave up their lives for the people of this country, and for others as well, and they must never be forgotten. Never. Julian Fane was one of those lucky enough to make it back to England. The return had a profound effect upon him. I was whistled onto a, an ambulance train and I was looking out of the window, which I could see very clearly because I was lying down flat and I was looking out. And I suddenly saw the most extraordinary sight. Um, I mean, some 20 miles away from me, we'd been in absolute hell. And suddenly there were men in flannels, white flannels, on very carefully mown turf playing cricket, as if, you know, nothing had happened. Really was like leaving hell and arriving in heaven. Joe Trinder was married shortly before leaving for France in 1940, and it had been nearly six months since he'd last seen his new wife, Iris. My wife was working at the post office here at that time. She was a telephone operator. And I pulled up outside the door and I just walked in and she was there. It was very emotional. Well, she just come straight round and we put her out of me. It was something you can't describe it. It was something like you got back again. You lost it, but you got it back. Because at times I never thought I would see her again. The story of Dunkirk and the Battle of France normally ends here. But in fact, after the last man had left the beaches, 
There were still over 100,000 British soldiers active on French soil. Many were in non-fighting units, and in the days following the Dunkirk evacuation, thousands were rescued from ports like Brest, Saint-Malo, and Saint-Nazaire. But 70 miles south of Dunkirk, there remained an entire frontline fighting unit, the 51st Highland Division. They had been fighting alongside the French, but had been cut off from the rest of the BEF during the German advance to Abbeville. By the 5th of June, Hitler's panzers were upon them. As the Germans swept towards them, the Seaforth Highlanders were ordered to hold a position on the banks of the River Brel, but they were soon overrun. Company runner David Mowat was sent to the forward lines with a message for the officer in charge, ordering him to withdraw immediately. But there were no officers left alive. Lance Corporal Rose was his name. I said, uh, where's, your, where's the officer? He's dead. Where's your sergeant? He's dead. Where's your corporal? He's dead. I said, you're, you're the only one left in charge. And yes, he said. But not all British soldiers had remained with their regiments. Bill Lacey had been separated from his colleagues at Dunkirk. Unable to find a boat to take him home, he went on the run. I was frightened to death all the time. I didn't realize where I was or what I was doing. Uh, one thing that stuck in my mind was that they were trying to form up a line in the south. Well, I had no idea where the south was, and I was being harassed all the way. By now, the only line in the south where the 51st Highland Division was putting up a brave resistance was beginning to crumble. We were at the end of our tether. There was, that, there was nothing we could do anymore. Orders were given to evacuate the division from the port of Le Havre, but their escape route was cut off by the Germans. They were forced back to these cliff tops high above the fishing village of St. Valerie on Co, where in desperation, some men tried to climb down to the beaches below, and many died in the attempt. St. Valerie was just, well, burned to the ground, more or less. Everywhere was in flames, and we knew that was, that was, that was the end. We couldn't do any, any more. After days of fierce fighting, St. Valery finally fell to the Germans on the 13th of June, 1940, and 8,000 men of the 51st Highland Division were captured, taking the total number of British prisoners of war to over 40,000. The fall of the Highland Division brought to an end the British Army's war in France in 1940. But for those men captured in battle, this was just the beginning of five long years of imprisonment far from home. David Mowat of the 4th Seaforth Highlanders was captured here at St. Valery on Co when the 51st Highland Division surrendered to the Germans on the 13th of June, 1940. Just hours after he was taken prisoner, David learned just how brutal his captors could be when together with the rest of the division he began a forced march from France to a prison camp in Poland. The men were quickly warned not to accept food or water from any civilians they passed on their way. But some men were so desperate, they found it hard to resist. The man in front of me was a, was a Scots guardsman. And he put his hand out, left hand out, to accept a sandwich from this lady. And the guard happened to be just right behind him and smashed his, the butt of his rifle on his wrist. And this guardsman turned round and gave him one of the finest right hooks that I ever had seen delivered and lifted that guardsman right over the wall and put him lying in the, in the garden and then walked on. And that guard caught up with him and right in front of me, 
He shot him through the stomach. That's what happened that particular day with me. After the Dunkirk evacuation, Bill Lacey remained on the run in France until October 1940. He spent four months living off the land, stealing clothes and evading capture. But as the weather began to take a turn for the worse, Bill decided it was time to try to get back to England. One night he came across a fishing boat in a small harbour, and having grown up in Ilfra Coombe in Devon, he was no stranger to the sea. It was pitch dark down there. Couldn't hardly see the engines leave alone anything else. But I thought, well, I'll have a go. And uh, got it going, cast off, and I was looking for the entrance out of the harbour, because it was, it really was pitch black. And at last I did see it. At the same time as I did see the entrance, so the searchlight came on me. Ooh. No sooner did it get on me, then they switched off, and I had to pull out, out, out of the harbour, and that was that. I was a very lucky man. Charles Waite spent five years as a prisoner of war in Poland after being captured in France in 1940. Like many prisoners of war, Charles was forced into hard labor by the Germans. Much of his time was spent working on the land or loading railway trucks. But throughout the course of his imprisonment, Charles did his best to sabotage the German war effort. Anything you can do to stop their war effort was ideal. So we did what we could. When we were potato picking, we trod as many back in the ground as we, did, as we picked up very often. For the five years he was in captivity, good food remained in short supply. On one occasion, Charles was served a bowl of rancid horse meat and in the spur of the moment, told one of his guards just what he thought of it. I said to him in English, that's not fit for pigs and I shot it across the farmyard. And I walked away from him to go to the little stable where they, were, where they kept their two horses, where there was a tap to wash my bowl and spoon out. But when I got there, I could hear him get up. I thought, oh, God, he's following me. So I turned around to face him, and he caught me in the chest with the bayonet. I don't believe for one minute he meant to pierce me with it. I think he, all he was doing was trying to frighten me with it. But I tried to move out of the way because I saw another one coming, but I caught that in the rib cage. But when I saw a third one coming, I thought, no, thank you very much. There's my temper. I've had enough. I dropped my bowl and spoon quick. I grabbed the barrel of his rifle, pulled it out of his hand, and just threw it on the ground. For his act of rebellion, Charles was ordered to face the camp commandant. He gave me a postcard and it was all typed in English. The prisoner of war, Charles Waite, was to be taken to his headquarters on the charge of incitement to mutiny. That scared the life out of me. <laughs> I really was frightened. Charles was sent into solitary confinement, but he was lucky to escape further punishment. David Mowat spent five years in captivity in Poland. He was finally released in 1945 and returned home to his family in Scotland. When I went home to my mum, my mum was in the garden. Well, she nearly collapsed. And I did as well. You know, because that was... 
Really six years, wasn't it? She, she was shocked, but she seemed me she said, you know, there was nothing left of me. I was thin as a break. I wasn't the boy that she, she remembered that left home in 1939. She had to get to know me again, sort of thing. Today, a monument stands on the cliff tops at St. Valery in memory of the men of the 51st Highland Division who gave their lives here. I'm proud of it. Proud of being a Seaford Highlander. Yes. The sacrifice of the 51st Highland Division and the courage of the other British regiments which held the line in 1940 were forgotten in the myth of the Dunkirk evacuation. It is the images of the returning heroes of the BEF that are remembered in history. But without the death or imprisonment of thousands of their colleagues, they might never have made it home. At the end of an emotional journey, Charles Waite has come to the Dunkirk Memorial to pay his respects to his colleagues from the Queen's Royal Regiment who didn't make it home. That's marvellous, absolutely. Yes. Never thought I'd be here. Never. I could cry. God rest her souls. Oh, I'm so pleased to be here, though. I'm so pleased to be here for them. I really am pleased.